All right, so I am refuting Rishabh Pandit's um, claim of fact. Um, his main claim is that excessive use of technology in our lives is detrimental to learning and productivity. His three secondary claims are that multitasking triggered by technology is all pervasive amongst college students and significantly impairs their learning. Uh, second is nature nurtures productivity. Increased exposure to technology intense environment has reduced exposure to nature in our daily lives and impedes replenishment of the cognitive functions <coughs> of the brain. And the third is that information overload on the internet and social media has shifted the focus on consuming more content rather than absorbing or learning. So my response to claim one is that um, there's really no, he, he makes a claim that 80% uh, of college students admit to texting in class, um, and, but there's really no evidence within his claims that show how bad it affects the learning. Um, his main claim is that it is detrimental, but it doesn't really show how bad it is. There's no, there's no stats or data on how badly it affects um, the, the learning ability of the student. Um, he also claims that multitask, all, multitasking is bad, but multitasking is actually uh, necessary in some points. Um, he makes claim that 42% uh, of students have their laptop uh, open with non-related uh, software, but um, just because they have it open doesn't mean that they're actually using it. It could just be running in the background. And multitasking with the laptop is sometimes necessary because the uh, PowerPoint, uh, you can have the PowerPoint slides closer to you. And uh, his secondary claim is that nurture, nature nurtures productivity. Um, there's no really, so, no, his claim is that nature um, nurtures productivity, but there's no evidence that it actually nurtures it. He put evidence that there that it nurtures creativity, um, that uh, there was 56 people, which is a small sample size, that went into the wood or into nature for four days and then scored 50% better on creativity on the creativity test. But that doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, it's that technology and not going into nature is actually detrimental to learning or productivity. He's just saying that it boosts your creativity, which uh, is not enough. And then he, uh, um, he also makes the assumption that because there's, you have access to more technology, you go to, into nature less, but he doesn't really define what nature is. Um, is just going outdoors nature, or is like walking through the uh, to the rose garden enough to be considered as nature. Um, so it doesn't really, it's not very specific on what nature is, so it's kind of hard to uh, actually make claims regarding that. And um, his last one is that, um, information overload on the internet and social media has shifted the focus on consuming more content rather than absorbing and learning, which kind of has two parts. Um, he says that data overload occurs because of technology. I work in uh, customer service, and I, he, he uh, does a claim that uh, the average office worker receives 121 emails a day and 49.7% of spam, so that's kind of data overload for you, but I, I get around the same amount. Um, just delete what's not necessary, it's spam. It doesn't really overload me. Uh, I can do my homework where I work, uh, it's not really a big deal. Um, he also has another uh, evidence that um, a group of 56 adults uh, scored 50% better on a, let me see. Oh, he makes a claim that one of the byproducts of information overload is a lack of quiet time available for planning, reflecting, or being creative. Um, he says that we are now less capable of thinking, generating creative ideas, and effectively solving problems because of that. Because of that, there's not actually like any numbers or any actual like studies or evidence showing that that is true. Um, his reasoning is, is kind of flawed and kind of uh, doesn't really have evidence to back that. And then. Um, And yeah, that was basically it.
All right, we generally know what the advocate's position is, and you've got some general responses on those points. Uh, on the first point, for instance, you say that there's not enough to show that, or there's no evidence that shows that this uh, affects learning, uh, and you mentioned that there's no statistical data. I think you could use some information on this point to uh, suggest then the opposite. If you had any evidence and you can contrast that to the lack of evidence from the advocate, that would be a lot more convincing. Now, both of you don't have evidence according to what I've heard, and both of you have made arguments. Now it's just a question of, well, which argument seems more reasonable, and, and both, of, you know, both of them are subject to the same kinds of press in this situation. Uh, the multitasking thing, I mean, I, the idea that uh, the programs that are open, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're using them. I, I understand that. I think that's a, a little bit of a press. And then you kind of have this counter example that says, and besides, they would be opening them like PowerPoint, you could see it better. Well, that would be an example of a program that was relevant to the issue, not one that was not relevant to the issue. So it probably doesn't fit the evidence that was being presented on that particular point. So there's a lot of places where you're offering presses without much evidence to back up your own claim. Uh, the, you've got a reasonable question to ask here or there. You've got some challenge that might be acceptable in uh, kind of an abstract context. I do think, for example, on the second point, that there's a very good issue about you know what constitutes you know uh, being in nature and uh, how much exposure you have to have in those situations the hypothetical of walking through the rose garden is an interesting one um, but again this is one of those places where uh, your response is equally as ambiguous as the advocates response and I guess the idea that uh, everything is equally ambiguous does put you in a little bit more advantageous position than it would for the advocate. But if, you know, when I'm listening to the argument and he's presenting evidence and you're just making assertions, that's going to be a little bit problematic. Um, on the third point on uh, the amount of data that we consume and, and that sort of thing, uh, your argument comes down to, well, you know, it's we all get spam. Well, that doesn't just, yeah, that, that's true. And does it irritate people? Does it interfere with their ability to function? Do they have to pay attention to it? No, you just delete it. Well, you have to look at it to decide whether or not to delete it. Isn't that what the advocate's talking about? Isn't that a, a kind of distraction that in, you know gives us some sensory overload? Uh, you, you say it doesn't have any effect on you, but that's a, you know, your own personal opinion in that situation, and I don't know that that's an accurate opinion. I'd have to look at your life a little bit more closely, and I'm afraid I don't have the insight and the ability to do that. Uh, presentation issues. Uh, you have a tendency to talk to the desk when you get stuck. You just start looking down and delivering your speech to the desktop. You don't want to do that. At the end, we got one of those, yeah, that's it, kind of exit lines, and you've got to do better than that. All right, thank you.